Now, despite its harsh masculine aesthetics, Scuola too betrays melodramatic influences, adopting the viewpoint of its female pupils, many of whom are the victims of unscrupulous adolescent boys. Barbaro further emphasizes how the 19th century literary serials, protracted length and mass appeal, enabled it to get close to its audience and even to modify its course in light of reader response. So that's another unique capacity of the serial. And Barbara begins his account going back into the 19th century uh, and the literary variant, where you could actually trace changes during the narrative and the characterization in response to a, a writer, a, a reader complaint and, 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 and uh, approval and so on. And what he call, he refers to its interactive dynamic of writing and reading, which drew in the public and reveals how the world of the reader penetrated the process of writing and left footprints in the text. I like that phrase, where the reader leaves footprints in the text. Now, of course, we're not talking about literature, we're talking about the uh, uh, contemporary television serial. And here, of course, the writing and <coughs> reading dynamic is replaced by a filming viewing equivalent bolstered, of course, by the online comment phenomenon. As Elizabeth Lozano and Armin Singal suggest, the serial is, quote, recreated and reenacted in public gossip through oral and communal sense-making, end of quote. And this communal sense-making is crucial to Schwaller's significance, I think. One further ramification of the narrative tension traversing the institution-based serial is that it's capable of supporting both metonymic and metaphorical interpretations. I'll tell you what I mean. The messy, open-ended realism of its plot lines enables it to claim metonymic adjacency with lives lived in society at large. But the closure to which those plots and the discrete boundaries of the settings in which they unfold, submit, also encourage viewers to posit those settings as self-contained metaphoric models of society at large. Now, the submergence of the national question, what the Russians like to refer to as nationalny vapros, within a larger paradigm of issues, intergender, intergenerational, interclass, indicates both the acute danger it poses to national cohesion and its embeddedness within Russian so, uh, social structures. And I'm going to point to the symmetrical pairing with the intergenerational plot line and its internal representation as a drama within a drama, one of several self-reflexive devices evidencing this privileged status. Uh, the drama within the drama is actually um, uh, in the form of um, production of Romeo and Juliet, which of course is a Shakespearean play also dealing with tension, in, 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 inter-ethnic, uh, inter-class tension. Ultimately, the serial format struggles to contain the multi-tiered complexity that embraces. In particular, Schwarz's rhetoric of universal empathy and the accompanying logic of representation is subverted by the visceral excess uh, <coughs> Uh, the detail and the controversy seepage into paratextual space. I'm going to clue, conclude, however, this contradiction and Channel One's rejection of attacks from outraged conservatives signal a maturing of the post-Soviet hegemonic strategy and the potential to transcend the oppressive rigidity characterizing Russian state broadcasting. Now, of course, it cannot be applied whole scale to post-communist societies, but this conception of hegemony does address the official Russian multicultural tolerances agendas encounter with patriotic populism on one hand and subcultural xenophobia and dissident liberalism on the other. Because it avoids the twin dangers of number one, measuring the Russian political class's grip on power by the amount of force, political, juridical, physical, at its disposal, and this is the mistake I think many Western commentators make uh, when commenting on, on, on uh, the Russian media. And number two, dismissing subcultural forms as somehow peripheral to the exercising of that power. Uh, and the fact that Schola was portrayed both as an audacious challenge 
to Tremlin authority and as its legitimizing tool indicates its centrality to the circulation process to which Barbaro refers. And that, that's more or <coughs> less the end of my sort of um, theoretical uh, section. Um, so then now let's, let's look at how what I've talked about plays itself out within the Schwola phenomenon. For Channel One, the main state broadcaster, Schwola promised a boost to its rather staid programming schedule. Concerned about perceptions um, that it routinely disregarded younger tastes, and that its rival, NTV, host of Zona, remained closer to viewer preferences, Channel One saw the edgy Guy Germanica, director of the international award-winning Sie Umrut Aya Astanus. Anyone familiar with that film? Good. Uh, <coughs> Uh, as promising a boost to its performance in the ratings war. So it was a risk taking on a director of, 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 of this uh, sort of marginality to, to the Channel One sort of um, tone and agenda, but such was the need to improve the ratings that, that it was a risk they were willing to take. As one critic noted, a critic generally friendly to Channel One, quote, Channel One understood that it needed to change something it took the first illogical step towards the new viewer by releasing Schwola. It wanted to attract a new, young audience." End of quote. So the serial began showing at the beginning of 2010, January 2010, and was made freely available online. And in fact, it is still now freely available online. I'll show you the, uh, the web link in, in, in just a moment. It swiftly attracted the critical attention of Duma deputies who demanded that it be banned. One communist deputy stated that he felt dirty after watching it and wanted to wash his hands. Still he carried on watching it. <laughs> wanted to wash his hands. Um, <clears throat> Uh, the uh, uh, sort of Kremlin-approved uh, party, Edina Rassia, actually divided halfway, split in two, over uh, Shkola. So there was huge controversy and debate uh, and scandal, and yet Channel One remained undeterred, arguing in a statement released on its website that, quote, the year of the teacher is not an excuse to lacquer over the problems in our schools, but a reason to get to grips with them. Close quote. And then, on April the 12th, 2010, none other than Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin intervened, <laughs> saying, quote, I haven't seen this serial. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't have time. <laughs> and that's sort of nothing, nothing particularly interesting or, 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 or uh, eloquent about that. And then he goes on to say, if you haven't watched it, then you don't want to say, as in Soviet times, I condemn Solzhenitsyn, although I haven't read him myself. <laughs> we know of the problems and we are trying to react to them. It probably is necessary to draw attention to them. And that was Putin. And ironically, in an authoritarian society, you don't argue with your leader when he instructs you to permit free discussion. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that was the end of the debate. And in another paradox, some bloggers saw Schwola as having been deliberately planned to provoke an outcry against its negative depiction of Russian schools and thus generate support for the beleaguered teaching profession. A view inadvertently endorsed in a Channel One discussion of the serial by Alexander Isayev, president of the Duma Committee on Social Policy, who described the program as a present to year of the teacher. So the Sort of rather sort of uh, uh, counterintuitive point that he was making was that it was so shocking and so negative about teachers that it generated all this wave of support for a poor uh, misrepresented teaching profession and that it was all a conspiracy. <laughs> uh, whatever you think about that, there's no question that viewer ratings confirmed the level of interest it elicited among all age groups. According to statistics uh, published in Kommersant, the 18 to 30 group remained the most enthusiastic. They accounted for 22 to 23% of the entire television audience during the early evening showing. And that's, that's quite something. But 
Um, perhaps even some more interesting is it attracted significant viewer shares amongst people up to 55 years old. Uh, and I just about squeeze into that demo. I won't say by how many years I squeeze in. <laughs> I, I do squeeze in. In one year, the 45 to 54 year old group, and I still squeeze in there too, <laughs> ac accumulated 14% of the share. Um, and, and, you know, I was trying to think of, of a sort of similar, similar serial in the UK or the US which people like me would, um, would, would carry on watching. And, and I'm not, I'm not sure I can think of one. Despite another interesting fact, despite its unspecified Moscow setting, so it, it is set in Moscow, the series watched in the provinces. Judging by the online forums, viewers divided into three main categories. Those who welcomed the serial's honesty, those who accused it of insulting Russia's teachers and children, and those who felt that actually things were far worse in reality. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that probably from my sort of rather unscientific um, uh, exploration of these forms, they fell into roughly equal categories. And, and just to give you a brief but representative selection of comments from the official program site, uh, let me just read you three. So there's one blogger who writes in and says, I've never seen anything more truthful. Super idea. This is real school, just as it is in life. And then another one, to contrast. They collected all the very worst things that could happen in school, and they shoved them, Zapichnolia, into one film. Complete rubbish. Polny atstoy. And then a third one, in our school at that age, it was 150 times worse. <laughs> Quite why 150, I'm, I'm not too sure. <laughs> 150 times worse in the 1990s in our school, it was far harsher. So that's, that's just a sort of very brief dip into the uh, comment or response. Now, on the 21st of June 2010, Channel 1 indicated that contrary to the demand, there would be no series two of Shkola. So although it got its way in being allowed to carry on showing, it conceded that there would be no sequel. It did, however, broadcast an hour-long discussion in which a Duma deputy and a retired teacher argued vociferously with one of the actors, some real school pupils, and the television celebrity Tina Kandelaki, who defended Shkola. A month earlier, Guy Germanica was invited to become a creative director of the rock music channel MTV Russia in recognition of her serial. And those three events symbolize this ideological schizophrenia characterizing the, the Russian public sphere. So you're probably wondering what on earth was, was all the fuss about. Viewers had certainly never seen anything quite like Shkola before. The script was skeletal and relied on improvisation, so the actors were given barely no script and they, they improvised very well. Um, <clears throat> and that added to the authenticity, and that distinguishes it from Zona, for example, in which the, you know, there was no improvisation, there was a script. The language was appropriately riddled with youth jargon and some curse words. Misbehavior in lessons was improvised with uncanny conviction. <laughs> <laughs> The serial features gratuitous sex and violence and close-ups of drunken, vomiting pupils, so it doesn't pull any punches. Scholar's cultural liminality is enhanced by the ability of character types to migrate to the surrounding context. So these internet forums show that just as the young characters formulated their own interpretation of the skeletal script, so their teenage fans emulated their language and their mindsets in a symbiosis facilitated by a shared subcultural idiom. So again, to give you one example, um, how, I'm not quite sure how one translates blin, but something like fri friggin' hell. Yeah? Uh, friggin' hell, why do we have to wait so long for the next episode? What a kashmar nightmare. I love, I love translating these, uh, these comments. <laughs> Uh, and I struggle with them. Others treat the characters as real acquaintances. This time it's not Blin, but Blin. <laughs> Friggin' hell. She's really driven me crazy. Zabiesila, your Budilova, who's one of the characters. 